Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm so delighted to see, first of all, so many people here this evening for this exciting program, and also so many new faces in addition, or names, I should say, uh, in addition to uh, many of our regulars and um, people who've been participating in our programs right along since we began doing them in April uh, virtually. So welcome, everybody. I'm not going to talk too long because I know you're eager to hear what Maria and Marilyn have to say, but I do have just a few housekeeping things. Um, first of all, uh, many of you may be new to Crowdcast, which is the platform we're on this evening. Um, you are already chatting away. I'm glad to see that. Please continue to do that throughout the program. Um, it's uh, really fun to see what you have to say to one another. Uh, chime in, tell us who you are and where you're from. Um, we've been finding that people from all over the world, all across the country, take part in our virtual programs. So please do say hello and know that the chat lives on. Um, this uh, program is being recorded, so you can watch it again anytime you like. Uh, and that you can continue to chat with one another. So if you make a friend or a, a connection, uh, you can continue to chat right here. However, having said that, if you have a question for Maria and Marilyn that you'd like to um, be posed during the question and answer session that's going to come toward the end of our program tonight, um, please use the ask a question function, which is right about in the center of the screen uh, at the very bottom. There's already one question there. So um, please put your questions there. That's going to make it a lot easier for uh, Marilyn when she does the Q&A uh, toward the end. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to uh, another feature, which is that long green button that's right under my face right now that says your support is vital to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, that, that sounds kind of like a, a, a you know, cliche, a catchphrase, but in fact, it's true. Uh, the Mark Twain House uh, has been uh, like so many other organizations, really challenged during this past year. Um, we have uh, maintained uh, these virtual programs since the very beginning. Um, they are, as we like to say, um, free to you or, or low cost to you, but um, generally not free to us. And every single cent, every penny that anybody uh, shares with us is really put to good use and deeply, deeply appreciated um, by the staff and the board of trustees of the Mark Twain House and Museum. So if you're able, and we understand that not everybody is, but if you're able to share a little or a lot, um, know that it will be uh, put to good use and, and, and deeply appreciated. So thank you for that. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to that. Uh, we've been putting programs on the calendar like crazy lately. Um, and we have a whole lot of them coming up soon. Very quickly, next Thursday, Chris France, uh, founding member of Talking Heads and the Tom Tom Club, is going to be here talking with Roger Catlin, former rock critic for the Hartford Current. March 2nd, we have the author Chang Ray Lee. And if you've been paying attention to any book reviews in the past week or so, you've seen many spectacular reviews uh, for his new book. On March 9th, Emma Brown and our friend Richard Holland are going to be talking about Emma Brown's new book, uh, To Raise a Boy. And it's going to be about the challenges of raising a son in the, our culture and society. And then on March 11th, uh, we have uh, the author of a new book about the legendary director Mike Nichols um, that you won't want to miss. That too is getting incredibly good reviews. And that's just the next couple of weeks. There are tons more. I'm not going to list them all. Please go to our website, marktwainhouse.org, um, to check out the rest of them. So uh, I do want to say uh, some of you had questions about the uh, about Maria's book, and um, I'm sorry that you haven't received those yet. Um, they are available for purchase. My friend Jacques, uh, who helped put this program together, uh, has put a link in the chat. Um, there, there's a little bit of a delay. First of all, the mail is so slow these days, and uh, we've been really encountering all kinds of delays, and we're really unhappy about that. But we will get your books to you just as soon as we possibly can. Um, and, and know that we're doing our best. So thank you for your patience and forbearance um, as far as that goes. So having said all that, it's time for me to introduce our guests. And I was just chatting with M Marilyn and Maria uh, before we came on and saying it was impossible to whittle their bios down to anything manageable. They both are so accomplished and have done so, so much. Um, and here's what we agreed to. We're going to tell you that Mar Marilyn Alvario uh, who grew up here in Hartford, um, is the founder, creator, and CEO of Latinas Empower. 
which is an incredible organization. And um, you can check them out on their website, latinasandpower.com. And uh, Maria Hinojosa, who many of you will know, uh, is the anchor and executive producer of Latino USA and the founder of Futura Media. So um, I ask you to help me give a great big Mark Twain House and Museum welcome to our guests, Maria and Marilyn. So take me a second to get them up here on screen. Here we go. Welcome, Marilyn and Maria. Um, we're Hi. looking forward to your chat. Hello, and, hello. <laughs> and I'll see you at the end. So Thank enjoy you, Jennifer. Have fun. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You look great, Maria. Thank okay. you. But I'm, bare, I'm barefoot. So, you know, I look great, but barefoot. <laughs> okay. Just a question. Is there an echo? Because I hear an echo. You do not hear an echo? Okay. Maybe we'll go, it will disappear, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so good to see you. But um, yeah, so thank you to uh, the Mark Twain House, Jennifer, and for our introduction, and especially for uh, Buzz Engine, who connected uh, me, Latinas in Power, uh, and the Mark Twain House to host this evening's uh, chat with you. I've been following you for a really long time, Maria, and um, you're amazing. Uh, you are such a survivor, first of all. <laughs> um, but I have, I was so inspired when I received the book a few weeks ago, I dove right in. I was not only inspired by the book, but it just, I was drawn in completely. Um, I was able to relate to, to so much in the book, and it was entertaining, uh, especially the part about salsa dancing in New York, because I'm a salsera as well. Um, Johnny Pacheco died yesterday. I know que Dios lo tenga descansando. I was just retweeting uh, <clears throat> people who were just saying El Faisan ha dejado de cantar, you know. It's such a, a a beautiful story, also of love between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, and 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 so just yeah, may he rest in peace. Too young. Yeah, absolutely too young. Um, I do have Fania All Stars live album here, live at the Cheetah. I brought it out because um, you know I used to go dancing there. I used to sneak out of my town in New Britain, my sister and I, and we pack up the car and, and go into the city and go salsa dancing. And I was actually at live at the Cheetah. Oh my so, God. Cause yeah. I, I just used to cover as a young journalist, I would go to the, um, what was it? The salsa festival at Madison square garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, one time I was just backstage with mm -hmm. all of the greats oh. and I, all, Celia of the, all of the Celia yeah, was there. Everybody. Johnny oh, Pacheco I saw pictures was there. of you with Celia. Oh, Celia. Celia was, Celia would send me postcards. I have Celia Cruz's postcards on my altar. I'm a very, we're very lucky that we experienced that part of, yeah. of musical history of this country. It's pretty amazing. And Sasa is very much alive today. So, yeah, absolutely. So, as I was reading your book, I, I so appreciated. Um, how you were able to document a very dark chapter in our history and not only to document that but also to provide us with this historical landscape of what is going on and you know how we got here and i remember and i'm sure for you too as a latina growing up in the u.s in social studies and in history not learning very much at all about contributions that Latinos made. Um, so what you're doing is so, so important for not just us, but for future generations, because you're telling the truth. And there's very little of that in our history books. And I have to tell you, I, um, I didn't know so much. There's so much in there that I learned and I didn't realize that you know, I was actually learning because the book was so entertaining and, you know, uh, weaved in with 
all of your escapades. Um, so for those people that have not had a chance to read the book. It's really one of those put down books, can't put down books. So you definitely want to get it after today's chat. So what I thought I'd do is um, for those people that have not read the book to ask you to give us a kind of high level summary of what the book is about and what inspired you to finally say, basta ya, I've got to write this book. So it's really interesting. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much for the beautiful introduction and to the Mark Twain house and to the state of Connecticut where mm -hmm. I am right now. Oh, that's right. I know people are like, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Mexican Chicago in New York or Harlemite. But <laughs> now because of the pandemic, you know, we've spent a lot of time in our little cottage Boca Chica in, in Bethlehem, Connecticut. So I'm uh, a, I'm kind of like, of yeah, Boca Chica. yeah, yeah, we call know. it Boca Chica, and I'm just like, well, let's see. After I make dinner tonight, am I going to deal with the wood, the firewood that I've got to bring in, or I'm going to do it tomorrow morning? And people are like, what is she talking about? Doesn't she live in Harlem? It's like, yeah, I'm okay. And we live in the woods, like we have a teeny, teeny, tiny, what used to be a fishing cottage, in the woods that we've made winterized. Anyway, so I wasn't looking to write a book. Writing a book for a journalist like me. Um, where I'm used to daily deadlines, weekly deadlines. It's really hard. Um, also, the book business, the book publishing business is really brutal. It can be very, very hard. It's it's hard to sell books. It just is. Um, so that's why I'm so thankful for these events and for everybody who buys the book. Um, I'm so thankful because um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's something that we're doing to keep American literature alive and well. So thank you. Anyway, so what happened was I went viral on MSNBC. I said, illegal is not a noun. And that in 2016, actually, um, <clears throat> when Donald Trump was running for president. And my dear friend just said, that's the book you need to write. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'll write a little pocket book. Remember when we would be in airports and we would see the little pocket books, you know, you'd go buy your whatever chocolate you were going to eat and a magazine and a newspaper. And then you'd see a little book like Chimamanda Adichie, we are all, we are all feminists or, you know, and you you'd get the book. Right. And I was like, I'll write a little book, a little book that's illegal is not a noun and why you should never use that term illegal to refer to a human being and tell the story of how I learned that, which was from Ellie Wiesel. Not not a powerful badass Latino or Latina. It was Elie Wiesel who taught me that, and so <clears throat> who survived Auschwitz and, and the Holocaust. Um, so you know, long story short, I had to get a new agent. Mine had retired because I really was like, I'm not going to write another book, and no publisher wanted that little book. They actually were like, we want a big book. And when I finally got my editor from Simon and Schuster and Atria, Michelle Herrera Mulligan, Irish Chicagoan, Irish Mexican Chicagoan, um, and she said, I want a big book from you, Maria. And I was like, what? And so what ends up happening is a book that is right. It's much more than my life, which is fine. But it's that we use my life as an anchor to look at history, to look at policy to look at feminism, to look at uh, race relations, to look at the civil rights era, to look at specifically immigration policy and how it's both Democrats and Republicans who have been throwing us under the bus, even though, I mean, what up with the narrative of this country that it loves immigrants and the Statue of Liberty and give us your tired. No, 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 no. I mean, I wish it was true. It, it, and it And it is partly true, but is it is not the history of policy in this country to love and welcome immigrants. So that's how Once I Was You was born. Mm -hmm. So give us a really high level summary for people that have not read the book. What will they find in there? So in I, I love <clears throat> I love the blurb that Gloria Steinem gave. When Gloria Steinem, first of all, you know, I was like trying to get people to read the book and I, you know, her assistant replied and said, Gloria, like don't count on it. And two weeks later, I had an email from her and she was like, this book is multiple books in one. Mm -hmm. So you're not only, you're going to get a book that is talking about why, how does a family leave Mexico? Why does a family 
my father, who was a nerdy nerd medical doctor, ends up in Chicago. You're going to learn about um, the fact that it was both Democrats and Republicans that have been, since the 1880s, um, creating policy against um, immigrants. Um, and, and then something happened, which I wasn't, I mean, I knew I was going to write about feminism because I grew up with, you know, in the context of the women's movement. Um, but I didn't expect to write about my own rape. Mm -hmm. um, that was not something, yeah. but, you know, you're writing in a well. moment in history, right? And and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford had just uh, come public about this when she was 15. Well, I was 16. Right. And, and right. so um, so that that is as much as a f summary as I can give. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of journalism, a lot of behind the scenes. I end up working for Walter Cronkite, so there's a lot of juicy details about the media business, but also I think a pretty stark critique, also. Absolutely, and uh, in, in in the book, just in, in there, you're, you're uh, the first Latina too in many situations, um, and you know you've been in this industry for so long for the Latino media has not always been looked at as, um, you know, ready for prime time. So uh, you don't see uh, very many of us in the, in the newsrooms, you know, as anchors. And your struggle to have that voice to try and to compete with, you know, everything else that um, was already against you. One of the things that um, I so related to and, you know, being that, uh, Latinas in Power is all about empowering Latinas to be successful, you know, sharing those strategies for success with each other so that we can get up that rung and that ladder. And um, you talk a lot about the imposter syndrome and how, how that's one of the things that helped you survive through it, that you, you know, you may believe that, that you knew what you were doing in so many different instances. Talk to me about that. That's it. I mean, I made believe. I I convinced myself that I was making believe that I would could do these things. The truth is, I was doing them. Mm -hmm. So I had to convince myself that what was real was real. I found it very interesting that so many people, men and women, have identified with me talking about the imposter syndrome. I was not expecting that, honestly, because it. I don't know. I guess maybe I figured that there had been a lot of writing about the imposter syndrome. Yeah. But apparently not. And so people were just like, oh my God, but you're so successful. Why would you reveal that throughout your entire career until, you know, I would say maybe six, seven years ago, maybe six, that you stopped feeling the imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, and and I, th I think it's so important because I didn't, no, you know, I was going to see my Puerto Rican, Afro-Puerto Rican, Bronx-raised therapist and telling her, I'm terrified. You know, I was a, as a new correspondent at, at NPR and I would see her, I'd go down to her office twice a week in the village and I'd just be like, I'm just so scared. They're going to find out that I don't know what I'm doing. And she'd be, what well, you do know what you're doing. What did you do last week? Oh, I covered a breaking news story. I had three stories on. I was live on All Things Considered, you know, to you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You have to believe it. And and so I really just hope that by talking about it more, more of us figure out strategies to not spend time thinking that we're not where we're supposed to be because we're absolutely where we're supposed to be. So, you know, throughout the whole book, I was just horrified. There was just, there's a humanitarian crisis that is happening right now here at our U.S. borders. And you witness it. You're there on the front lines, starting when I open the book and you tell the story at McAllen Airport about this little girl that looks at you and she just looks straight through you. And then you see the line of children, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, 10-year-olds, and just following these adults without knowing what they were doing. The horrific scene that is taking place right now. How were you able to write this and to tell us this story um, without losing it? I mean, I, I don't, I don't yeah. know how you got to, how you. Well, I'm losing it. I'm losing it now. You know, just hearing you describe it because it is so horrible. It's not over. 
Um, and it's not just on the border. There are detention facilities here in Connecticut. There is a place on 125th Street off of Broadway where children who have been separated are taken to spend the day. In New York, they place them with foster parents, uh, foster homes. But during the day, they are in these facilities. Um, they are in some ways hidden in plain sight. And that's the story of what happened in the McAllen Airport. It was hidden in plain sight. Um, back when people were in airports all the time, you know, um, you may have seen this, uh, which would be a group of children dressed with ill-fitting sweatpants, sweatsuits, um, gray, blue. And you would look at the, I remember looking at a couple of times because I was always in airports before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I'm a very, I'm an airport person. I know like airport culture, you know, <clears throat> when I see a group of kids, I'm like, what, what are they doing? Are they with a team? And <clears throat> these kids did not look happy and they, they look completely mismatched. And, you know, airport kids are happy kids. They're getting on a flight. They're going someplace. These kids look numb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I ended up writing that introduction after I had finished the book already. And I had to go back and I used the words of my mentor and friend, Sandra Cisneros, mm -hmm. who said, don't always write about the things that you remember. You can write about the things that you have forgotten or wish you could forget. Um, and it's those horrible scenes mm -hmm. that you want to forget. And that's, that's how that chapter started. And, you know, and your writing, um, it's, it's not just in the book, but in, in your reporting as well. I mean, you have um, with Latino USA and with several other platforms that you are using to get your voice out there and to get the story out there. Um, you've done something similar with Black Lives Matter and how you have been able to tell that story, not from you know, what the image is of what Black Lives Matter might be, but the story behind that. So you had this unique ability to tell that human aspect of it. The thing is, is that as a journalist, I, I think part of what happened with this moment, and for me, the Black Lives Matter movement started the day the first enslaved person was brought here, was mm -hmm. the day that the movement started. Um, and I think <clears throat> what we have to realize is it's a, it's about dehumanization. Everybody was touched because we witnessed, and I I won't watch that. I won't watch the murder of George Floyd. I w I won't um, because I I, I want to remain. I, I I don't know. So I, I I just you know if I had to as a journalist <clears throat> because I had to, and I talk about that in the book, I will. But I can talk about this. And we can talk about this and we can understand that that as a country, <clears throat> it's we're trying to have a reckoning with the lack of humanity in this country. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's part and parcel of our of our history and we have to acknowledge it. I mean, I'll never forget the story of right here in Connecticut, Bethlehem, at our driveway, this guy comes to pick up the car that I was donating to public radio station. And he's he's a white guy in his mid fifties with wraparound mirror glasses and a buzz cut, and you know, uh, people might have thought he's a Trump supporter. And we start talking, and he he's the one who says we are standing on indigenous land, mm -hmm. and what and what the founders of this country said was true, but they were lying mm -hmm. because they weren't affording that to the indigenous people and to African Americans. They were not affording that love, life, and liberty, and democracy. Exactly. And so we have a reckoning, and the story of immigration is intimately tied because one, many immigrants are black right now. Detention facilities are filled with black immigrants from Af and refugees from Africa, from the black Caribbean, I mean, Jamaica, any of the islands um, from Canada. Um, so yeah, so there, this is something that is happening today and it centers on the issue of humanity. And that's what I'm hoping to try to get with the book 
is that we, and we can all see our humanity. I do that here as I'm driving around and I'm, I'm here in Connecticut. Uh, that's what I'm doing on a daily. I was at the post office at eight o'clock in the morning this morning. And I'm talking to Vera who works, works in our post office. And I told her Vera who is white, 60s, Catholic, raised here in Bethlehem, couldn't be more different. But that's how we do. We encounter each other's humanity and often in the people most unlike us. You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about what what we need to do, some solutions. Um, we know that um, many of these folks are coming to the U.S. because they're escaping uh, turmoil, they're escaping violence, they're escaping domestic abuse, um, the economy. And so there's that level of complexity that um, we need to either, you know, as a country or as, as a people to acknowledge, address, and try to start to talk about, you know, what can we do to help these countries? Today, uh, Jen Psaki, the White House uh, press secretary, uh, talked about was talking about the Biden administration's new uh, proposal for a path to citizenship for a million, uh, a million people um, and uh, a comprehensive uh, immigration. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to to be a part of those conversations because you're so involved in this, but um, I, I think that. There, there needs to, what would be, what would you say if you were at the table? What would be the top three things <laughs> that you would say, here's what we need to do? Okay. It, it's actually, to me, when people say, oh, Maria, you're sounding so radical. <clears throat> What's radical is what has happened in this country over the last, let's just say, 30 years. Ending with the most recent radical acts on the Trump administration, taking babies from their mothers, okay, and fathers, mm -hmm. in order to create a policy of punishment, of human suffering. Suffering was in fact the point. So at this point, the radical act of, if I say, you know what, stop all deportations now, ground every single airplane, no more deportations, they stop now open up all of the detention facilities and people will say, but they're criminals. No, no. A, they were caught walking and smoking a joint. Mm -hmm. Something that by the way, medical marijuana is legal in the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So people are being deported for one DUI or one smoking of a joint or something like a, taking part in a protest, which now, you know, it, it can be seen as a misdemeanor. So stop all deportations, open up all of the detention facilities for all of the nonviolent people. And by the way, they don't mind letting you know where they are. So it's not like they want to disappear. No, the data shows that immigrants commit less crime, not more. Immediate reunification of all of the families who have been separated, all, all. And I'm like, oh, all, like in the last 25 years, fathers who were deported from their children from places like here in Connecticut. Uh, yes, reunite them and free long-term medical, uh, uh, health, mental health services for all of them and shut down ICE, reconstruct the Department of Homeland Security that was born in an event that I survived 9-11 because I was in New York City at the time. I understand how tragic it was. You don't have to redo your entire immigration system because of the fact that there was a fault, okay? That would mean actually that we would right now redo the entire FBI because of the fact that the FBI for the last decade has let the ball drop on white supremacists mm -hmm. and anti-government militias. That we would say, oh, well, you know what? Look what just happened. Now we've got, we're going to, and it's like, people would be like, you're crazy. That's what happened with immigration. So we have to rethink entirely. And honestly, I'm not, I mean, I'm so thankful for everybody who is going to benefit from this because every, every immigrant, like even myself, not born in this country, we are exhausted. But for the White House spokesperson, 
Jen Saki to say, not a good time to be coming to the border. Not, not, you know, rethink it. Don't, don't, don't think that this is, I'm horrified. People just, are not making choices like, oh, my God, uh, I just read in, you know, saw the news that Biden is elected and, you know, I'm off. Right. These are refugees, mm -hmm. refugees. And it needs to start from his understanding of saying, I see you, fellow human beings. We see you. See, but that's the, that's the thing is that it's it, it feels like white liberal mindset is more detrimental in some cases um, when we're talking about, um, oh, we're going to do something about it. Um, you know, this is what we, we, we promise. I mean, Obama promised that that was the first thing that he was going to do, and he didn't. Uh, you know, so so there's, there's still a lot of uh, education, awareness, uh, conversations like this that people need to hear to see this is happening right now today and you can't stand by and watch this happen what can you do and there's a lot that people can do so you're exactly right this is not a moment where we just kind of let it happen and people are like well what can I do and I'm like well there is so much you can do I mean one you can ask people their story so again, I keep bringing it back to Connecticut because we're in Connecticut. I'm in Connecticut. I went to get my nails done. I hadn't had a manicure because I live in New York. I'm like, I'm not going to get a manicure in New York City. I'm just not. A manicure, but, you know, I'm suffering through. But there was a little spot here not by, not far. And I called and it turned out that's a Latina who runs it, Ecuadorian. And I find out that even her husband, her first husband, was deported. Her her twelve year old son is going to local schools, having lived through that and unable to speak about that in his school, because for him it is a source of shame. Mm -hmm. So even just talking to people, so that we recognize that it's happening all around us, then what can we do? I mean, you know, how can I help her? Of course, I'm like, well, how can I help? You know, here are some books. Here's my book. Here it is in Spanish. You know, um, eh, eh, so there's there's one to one human contact. There are so many organizations. You don't have to recreate the wheel. You can write letters. You can call your member of Congress. You can do church work for God's sake. You can go visit people who are in detention facilities. You can donate to Spanish speaking churches, Spanish language ch churches where you see. So I just gave you, what was that? Yeah, you just gave a whole list. right? And that was without thinking in 30 seconds. If I can do that, you can do something. So do you think that we have the right Latina and Latino voices at the table with the Biden administration to help guide what needs to happen? Look, there are some pretty incredible people. Uh, Julissa Reynoso is the chief of staff for uh, President Biden's, uh, well, for the first lady, Dr. Jill Biden. Um, and Julissa Reynoso is an Afro-Dominican lawyer, badass, and she's in charge of the reunification. I know Julissa has the best of intention in her heart to do this, but it, the, it starts from the head down. So Biden has to be the one who says, from my heart, the things that I said. And I'm I'm not sure. Are you optimistic? I mean, I want to remain optimistic. I remain optimistic because we're having this conversation and because then somebody who's watching this will decide to do something and maybe their life will change mm -hmm. because their life will change, right? Because the people who we're talking about are in our communities everywhere around us. So I have to remain hopeful. Um, I mean, I think one of the reasons why people decided not I mean, to, to, to vote out Donald Trump was in part because of his anti-immigrant policies. It was the clearest part along with his, frankly, his racism um, saying to white supremacist groups, stand back and stand by. Better have not said anything. So um, it, this is a moment for all of us. Mm -hmm. But I'm remaining optimistic, not because of one party or one politician, but because of democracy and people participated in democracy. And so I got to remain hopeful. You know, there's so many layers of horrific 
um, series of events that you outline in this book. Um, one of them has to do with the um, their internment camps. I mean, I want to say concentration camps like AOC, but you know they they are. And well, the they're not. Thing, when, when, you, when you say when you say because I know it's hard, people are like uh, concentration camps. Yeah, they are not death camps, right? Even though people are dying there at very high numbers for have committed no crime. Okay. But they are concentration camps. These are places where people, and the only difference, again, so I'm like, what is it? If I was not born in this country, I could end up there. My husband, who's sitting right next here, was not born in this country. He was born in the Dominican Republic. Therefore, he could end up there. That's what makes the difference between what's happening there and those concentration camps. Having said that, American citizens have ended up there. Okay, so, but the concentrate the the people who are being concentrated there are people whose only difference is that we were not born in this country, period. Mm -hmm. If I can add another layer of horrific to that, um, you know, and and I I read it not, not only in your book but in other places as well about the people that are working at these places that are supervising these places that are hired to to um, oversee um, that are actually uh, like sadists and pedophiles and and actually take pleasure in torture. I mean, I'm just so horrified at this that I needed to at least add that layer of horrific to this conversation because it, get, it gets even worse than that. Um, also, Thank you for saying it because it is horrible, but we have to see, we have to understand what's happening. You know, if you are a pedophile or a sadist, uh, if you have a criminal mind, you know exactly where to go find, where to go to find work in an immigrant detention facility. Um, background checks now, I mean, under the Trump There's administration. No background checks. No right. background checks. And they get audited basically by themselves. I've been reporting about consistent rapes, men and women, which in the adult facilities. So if it's happening there, it's happening with the children and the babies and the toddlers. I'm sorry, it is horrible. This is why anyone who is watching should do something. Yeah. And yeah. So we have a lot of questions, and I and I have a lot of questions, but it, it would be only fair if I um, I jump into the ask. I, I know that there's one that comes from Marilyn Cruz Aponte. Um, uh, she's out of, uh, out of Connecticut as well. She says, our nation's citizens are paralyzed by fear. On one side are those of privilege fearful of losing control, and on the other, historically disenfranchised, fearing continued denial of rights opportunities. There is an elite class manipulating both for power and money, caring nothing about our democracy. Who breaks the stalemate of fear and how? Woo. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that it's like big things um, it's big system-wide stuff like I was talking about. Like, yeah, actually deconstruct the Department of Homeland Security, reconstruct it, and ICE. So it's structural issues which take a long time. But it's also the one-to-one -one humanitarian. It's the one-to-one -one conversation. So I'm I'm a believer of both. Um, you have got to be able to put it, put things into a kind of historical context and a structural context. Um, and then you have to be able to also bring it to a, a very human level because that, you know, when you're giving humanity, you're getting it back. And I think it just makes us better people. And, and, and along those lines, there's um, a question about um, if you could address the historic failure of US policy. You know, what can we do um, about the in incredible violence? So, you know, as far as the U.S. policy that we currently have right now, um, uh, you know, I, I, it feels like a stalemate. 
Right. Which is why I'm saying that this isn't a moment to kind of sit back. Yeah. Um, this is probably the reason why President Joe Biden or Vice President Kamala Harris have yet to give me the interview, even though I've been asking now for since they were running, opposing each other, is because um, I'm going to ask that same question. It is a stalemate unless you do something that is extraordinary. And so, um, you know, I believe that we should have a national day of mourning and reconciliation around the issue of immigration, <clears throat> that there be a national apology. I mean, I'm talking something big. That's why I'm saying these things like open up all uh, stop the wall. Actually, Joe Biden, go to the wall, stand on the wall and say, I'm going to tear it down. And instead, he's still like, no, but I can't do that because then they're going to come. And it's like, oye me, pero por favor, people do not want to leave their countries. By the way, fact, mm -hmm. data, there is zero net migration from Mexico right now. Okay, people, uh, people do not want to leave their countries. And the United States right now is kind of going through a really difficult time. So it's not like people are like, okay, that's, you know, I'm, I'm going there. It's a false narrative. Your question about what do we do in order to help, for example, the countries that um, where people are, are running, seeking refuge is correct. But the United States has been in Honduras, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in Guatemala, and in Mexico for over, you know, over a century, making stuff happen there, you know, sending military aid. Did we forget about the military aid to El Salvador, the military in El Salvador, yeah, or creating the Contras? So people are like, oh, wow. Yeah. So we have to understand that what's happening now is tied to that history. And the United States is part of that history. And so it is a larger kind of understanding of our place in the world as well. Mm -hmm. DACA. Um, so DACA is supposed to run out, I think, in, in March. Um, do you know what the status of what's going on with that? Nothing. No, I, I, I don't. And I just, um, you know, for all of the people who are on DACA, you know, you are my heroes and heroines because you have to live your life every day not knowing. Um, I remember when the pandemic first hit and I was still on a plane and I remember just like, <gasps> you know, and nobody was wearing masks. And I was just like, I remember tweeting out saying like, wow, so now we understand what it is to live like an undocumented person where you walk out of your house and you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you're going to get deported or if you're going to lose your job because you're an immigrant or if you're in this case, if you're going to catch the pandemic, which or catch the, the virus, which I did. Um, so I, I, they are examples of patience. Mm -hmm. And by and the way, so they are, of they are, are so, contributing. I was going to say, and so many of them are first responders, medical doctors, nurses, exactly. caregivers in, yeah. in nursing homes. Our neighbors. Por favor. Our neighbors. Mm -hmm. O sea, por yeah. favor. Yeah. So let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about the Latino media, Latino journalists, the U.S. media, and how this topic is, is or not getting covered or written about in a way that brings the kind of outrage uh, like what happened with George Floyd? The problem is, is that um, this, uh, so again, all right, we're gonna look at this structurally. So I'm gonna go really high up here. When you think about the mainstream news media, it is owned and operated primarily by straight presenting white men of privilege. Um, and, and so they, who are many of our best friends, right? Love them, but they've been raised consuming the same narrative about immigrants, which basically has been in the United States. We love you, but actually, aren't you really just criminals? And there are too many of you. We except have, for you know, when we need you. Right, exactly, <laughs> except when we need you. So 
so the people who are running our news media have grown up reading the same thing. And so they have that in their minds. They, in order to break that, we have got to really have a, a very deep, again, national conversation. So what happens is, is that even now, for example, um, okay, we just went through an impeachment. I understand that we're, we're going through an impeachment, but if I was running, and that's why I created my own company because I got tired of saying, well, if I was running, they, well, I do run things now. <laughs> so we are covering this story consistently. The issue of what's happening in terms of immigration, Latinos and Latinas. Right now, Futuro Media, which I created um, 10 and a half years ago, we are the only ones that have a unit that is dedicated to investigating, doing deep journalistic investigations into Latinos, Latinas, and immigration. No other national news platform has that. I don't understand how that's possible since we're the second largest voting bloc in the United States. Why isn't there deep investigation all the time? Why are more Latinos and Latinas not on cable news all the time? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't get paid to go on cable news. I have to work to get asked to go on cable news. Like it doesn't just happen. I actually have to be just like, Hey, uh, you know, should I be doing that with my time? Right. Right, right, right. The thing is, is that what I'm not going to allow, there's a couple of things. One, ageism. Okay. That's a thing. It's a real That's thing a for thing. me, yep. for women, for women of color in our business. Um, and I'm not going to allow our invisibility. And so what's bothersome is that, you know, we can talk about the impeachment. You know, mm -hmm. it's not... It's, you want to talk about the, what do you want to talk about? Unemployment, the impeachment, education, healthcare. We can talk about it all. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very sad to say that um, essentially we remain still invisible mm -hmm. writ large. And worse now, we have to deconstruct the narrative that was constructed by the outgoing administration about who we are, which is a threat. And you know, one of the things that worries me is that there is a Latino leadership gap in our country because it feels like we have so many conflicting um, interests. Um, so, so somehow, whether it's through, I don't think our Latino organizations have a unified voice, uh, but certainly there is a gap there that, that, that we need to address. And to, to me, I, I, I can't, if someone to say, what is, who would you say are the top leaders in the Latino community in this country? I, I could not name. Yeah, I think I, I don't I don't know. Right now, I'm 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 expecting because the arrival of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, no one was was expecting that. I was waiting for it. There were many people who were like, "Nah, there is a new Latino leadership that's out there." And by the way. I think that the Latino leadership that exists, um, yeah, there are, the, because the thing is we can't really talk about Latinos, even though we do. I mean, I do a show called Latino USA, but part of what we dedicate our work to is to saying it's, we're really different. Mm -hmm. Like what's happening in California is very different than what's happening in Florida. And so for Latinos and Latinas, we're also trying to have a national conversation about what just happened. Um, How is it that people like me, who I'm very, very close to, uh, you know, who were very much anti-Trump became Trumpers, Trump supporters, mm -hmm. Latinos of sound mind. How is this? So what does that mean about who we are, what we rep represent? Um, you know, Latino and Latina evangelicals, huge population, very influential. Do we really understand? Mm -hmm. So I think that what we need to do is to help Latinos of every age, by the way, believe that you can be that leader. Yeah, absolutely. So who are the Latinas uh, shoulders that you have stood on? Oh, there are a lot. I don't know if I would say I stood on, but partnered with, you know, I immediately, um, in terms of Latinas, I think of Maria Elena Salinas, uh, Alma Guillermo Prieto, uh, formerly of the New Yorker. Um, I mean, there are not a lot of other Latinas, really, um, like on a national scale. So it, it was pretty, it was lonely, but there were other women of color 
Um, in my book, I write about Sandy Ratley, who was the first African-American vice president um, at NPR, who is my best friend and mentor, um, who's a black woman. Um, you know, a, a, there were so, you know, Ed Bradley, who was a black <clears throat> male journalist. So it wasn't, it wasn't that there was another Latina. I mean, John Quinones, I remember when he was, he became a network correspondent. We all knew each other because I was a network correspondent for NPR. He was doing ABC. Um, Maria Elena and Jorge Ramos were on Univision. There were very few of us who were doing national coverage. Um, but, you know, when you think, like going back, I stand on the shoulders of Frederick Douglass, my founding father. I stand on the shoulders of Ida B. Wells, investigative journalist who was born into slavery and then becomes top investigative journalist. I stand on the shoulders of Ruben Salazar, uh, you know, who was killed for doing work when he was working at the LA Times. Um, and so many, many shoulders. Um, and that's that's why I don't give up because I realize that now I'm putting shoulders up, out there Exactly. That people are standing on. And I'm like, yo, I'm only five feet tall. So <laughs> <laughs> so if you really quickly, we're running out of time and there's a lot of questions. And, uh, and I want to transition to leaving this conversation on a lighter note because this is such a heavy conversation. Um, what advice would you give your younger self today? That is one of the questions from our audience. Oh, to just, I mean, and I did, I think that, um, um, I, I think I did kind of believe that I had all that. And I'm, 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 I wrote, I write about it, you know, the Latina in me, you know, kind of like enjoyed being the woman in me, but I would just say, own it, own it, own it, own it, own it, own it so Take the much. Risk. Yeah, take the risk, jump off, just like, and it's what I try to convince my own adult children, but I know it's easier said than done, but you just got to kind of keep on saying it, just do it, do it, do it, believe in yourself, believe in yourself, you are all that, yes. And I heard, I think it was in your book, or it could have been somewhere else where it said, um, congratulate, congratulate yourself when you fail. <laughs> You know, I mean, in your book, you talk about a failure. You felt like a failure at six years. And it, I so related to it because when I started Latinas in Power, I was paying out of pocket. So after the sixth year, I had an ugly cry. And I said, I can't do this. And now it's, you know, 18 years later. And, you know, I, I made it through. But, you know, we congratulate yourself for those failures. Yeah, because you made it okay. through. You made it. You made. We ultimately made it through. We did. So I would like to close this conversation on a little bit of a lighter note, if you will oblige me um, with a would you rather question. Okay. Are you okay with that? Oh, yeah. Okay, Maria. Uh, would you rather get your face smashed hard into your birthday cake or accidentally get hit by a kid with a piñata stick? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I was hit with a piñata stick as a kid, and I never want to experience that again. So give me the birthday cake for sure. Okay, so this is a Latino version of Would You Rather. Uh, so for those who are not Latinos, you may not get the relevance here, but would you rather um, for a lifetime listen to a repeat of Tiempo de Van or... Mi burrito sanero. <laughs> si belen, si belen. I think I think it's mi burrito sabanero. Oh, isn't that the cutest? Okay. Now would it's gonna be stuck rather, in my head forever. <laughs> uh, would you rather use your chancla or te calmas or te calmo to scare your kids? Definitely not chancla. Te calmas o te calmas? <laughs> te calmas o te calmo? <laughs> Let's see how much time we have left. I think I have to leave two minutes for for uh, for uh, for esta muchacha. Okay. Would you rather have Despacito play every time you hit the brakes or gasolina 
play every time you speed up. Like gasolina. <laughs> I think gasolina. Gasolina, ¿por qué? <laughs> well, you know, when, when gasolina came out, I actually was running a lot, <clears throat> listening to it. And so when you say it, I just instantly remember like running and I'd be running actually in the Dominican Republic. And so I like love that feeling. And also my husband says that I have a, una pata de plomo, uh -huh. that I have a lead foot, a fitipaldi, uh -huh. that I really like to go fast. The cool thing is, is that over the last year because of the pandemic, now my two adult children know how to drive because, you know, New Yorker kids, they never learn how to drive, exactly. but they did. So I don't have to drive anymore. And people in the comments are agreeing with you. They want gasolina as well. Okay, two more. I have a whole whole page here. Would you rather live music, uh, live without music or novelas? Would you rather live uh, without music or novelas? I, I can I cannot live without music. So I'll do I'll do without okay, Downton Abbey okay. and novelas. All right, and the last one. <laughs> Since you are a Har Harlemite. Uh, would you rather eat Mexican tamales or Puerto Rican pasteles? Oh, Mexican <laughs> tamales. But they have to be they they have to be right. The whole thing is moisture. So I'll have a tamal first and then I'll have a pastel. And you know what my favorite pasteles are from the Caribbean actually are pasteles de yuca, which are oh. very hard to Do you know what I'm talking about? Is that your little puppy? Yeah, so this is Lily. She wanted to jump up and say oh, hi. Oh, Lily, did you see Walter? Walter came yeah, to I say did. hi. Before. I did. Oh, yeah. I did see. Hi, Lily, sweetie. Okay, so we're going to do a quick plug. You have a podcast. I just wrote down the thing that you uh, that launched last week. Um, oh, my God, us, yes. You have please. 30 seconds to tell us about it. Please. Well, just go to Futuro Media, and you can look at all of our podcasts. But the one that just dropped is called Suave. And you're like, what? It's like Suave, the shampoo. And you're like, well, it's about shampoo? No. It's about my relationship over 25 years with somebody who was sentenced to die in prison. And then he gets out. And it's uh, an extraordinary. I mean, if you just go to suavepodcast.org, right. real easy, suavepodcast.org, click on the trailer. The trailer is riveting and then you can listen to latino usa in the thick we just dropped a selena podcast which is like fabulous so check us out doing a lot Good. so maria i am going to invite you to hartford on october 15th to uh the latinas in power symposium at the marriott hotel we will do a reception in your honor uh, a book signing to promote your book and Get all the bells and whistles out for you. Yay! Exactly what you deserve. It was my pleasure to talk to you today. Oh, and also I'll be sending you a Latinas in Power beautiful map. Oh, I can't. I can't wait. I want. Yeah. Oh my God, that's cute. Yeah, it is. It is. All right. Well, Jen, I think you're coming back. There she is. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> what a fabulous evening what a fabulous conversation i can't believe the two of you did not know each other before no, because the way that time. conversation flowed you just seemed like your best friends and uh that was so delightful now maria it might have been a tactical error for you to let us know that you actually are in connecticut because we're going to want you to do this again um we're glad you're neighbors you have and no idea how happy i am to do things uh for my now third state um yeah. of Connecticut. I'm all about I'm all about talking about what's happening here. I mean, I've witnessed the transformation of places like Danbury and Waterbury and Southbury and all the berries. <laughs> um so I'm 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 here for it. And I think my next event actually we're I'm already booked to do something at the Danbury Public Library. So I think virtually for now. But I'm so in ready to be there in person with you. Well, we're looking forward to it. Please, both of you come back. And, and Marilyn, you did an awesome job. Thank you. And I love the would you rather. You, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to our wonderful audience. You know, whenever we have speakers, even before we went virtual and we're doing live programs, our speakers would always say, oh, my goodness, your audience has asked the best questions. And once again, um, our audience has been, audience, uh, has been awesome. So thank you for being here. Thank you 
Marilyn, thank you, Maria, and I hope to see you both again very soon. And um, have a great night. Bye, everyone. Go, thank I'm you, everyone, go. for all the great comments. Yeah, and I'm going to go get the firewood now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right, everybody, wave goodbye. I'm going to end the broadcast. <laughs> good night, and thank you so much.